One now here on Kiwi. Time to steer it into space. Astronomy type stuff, all that kind of bizzo with uh, with Dylan Story, twitter.com forward slash Dylan Story. Good morning, Dylan. Good morning. Good morning. First up, let's look at the supermoon, which is happening this weekend. Supermoon sounds scary to me. Yeah, it does sound pretty scary, eh? But um, I can assure people that it's, it's not an astronomical term. Supermoon is just a sort of a, a coined phrase. Um, so what it is, is for observers of the moon, the full moon this weekend will be slightly bigger than other full moons of the year. Does that mean it's growing in size, the moon? It's bulging? Unfortunately not, no. There's, there's not a, a giant uh, animal about to burst out of it or anything like that. <laughs> okay, what's um, going on? Okay, well, the moon, as it orbits the Earth, its orbit is not perfectly round, so that means it's slightly elliptical. So that means that at certain times it's slightly closer to the Earth than at other times. Um, and so its, it's uh, distance orbit is the same as its... Um, position orbit, so it takes about a month to go from its closest point back to its f- through its furthest point and back to its closest point again. Yeah. So the closest point is called perigee, and the farthest away point is called apogee. Um, and the distance is it's pretty significant, really. It varies between about three hundred and fifty six thousand kilometers and about four hundred and five thousand kilometers. So that's mm. that's quite a bit. Yeah, significant. It's quite it's quite a percentage difference. Um, so the difference, so this happens every month. A perigee happens every month where it comes at its closest point to Earth. Um, difference with this one is that it happens to occur on full moon. So we like to look at the moon on full moon. This time the full moon is going to be slightly bigger than other full moons of the year. Right. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, to the naked eye, you'd be, you'd, you'd go, whoa, heck, big moon. That's about it. Yeah, I mean, I I often ask myself, would I notice it if um, if I wasn't sort of watching out for it or, or diligently looking at it? And the answer is probably no. Every time, you know, when you see the full moon, you're like, oh, that's big. Um, but would you would you actually notice if you weren't looking out for it? I don't mm. I don't think so. There's going to be a small. A, can appear um, 14% bigger than at its when the full moon is at its furthest point, and yeah. up to 30% brighter, depending on depending on atmospheric conditions. Um, and but you know, there's there's going to be nothing that's strikingly different. You're not going to walk outside your house and go, "Wow, it's huge." Yeah, could be um, impressive at moonrise, I suppose, because that's when the um, the moon always looks bigger due to the what the amplification of the atmosphere. No, it's not the apple. That, that's a bit of a myth, actually. Oh, okay. It's um, what's what's known as the moon illusion. And the best explanation there is, anyway, for this phenomenon is that um, we perceive the sky in in our in our little spatial awareness, human brains. We perceive the sky to be a sort of a shallow dish overhead of us, not not a perfect sphere or a half sphere overhead of us. So. Um, when we see the moon on the horizon, we expect it to be a long way away on this, this shallow dish that we see as the sky. Mm. Um, when we see it above us or high in the sky, we expect it to be closer on this on this shallow dish. So when we see it above us, it doesn't look as big because we're expecting it to be closer. So we're expecting it to look bigger, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, it could be uh, an exciting weekend. I'm, I'm off to... Um uh, Lake Rotoiti, Rotorua, this weekend, and and they're expecting fog um, in the early morning, and I guess in you know over, overnight as well. Um, could be quite spooky around the lake. With could the, be quite spooky on those lakes. Yeah. yeah, maybe ghost walker through the mist. Who knows? Absolutely. With the full um, that full super moon. Interesting. Full moon's always it was quite bright. Of course, I was up. Um, I mean, any any moon on a clear night is really bright. I was up late last night and. It was it was like it was it was casting shadows and it was like walking around in daytime. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, look out for the super moon. Uh, up next, we're talking about um, black holes. Um, I saw a pretty impressive picture of a black hole on the front front page of Stuff yesterday, um, and they're t- t- talking about them being more like Venus flytraps than than more vacuum like, cleaners. Um, than vacuum cleaners. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, 
I mean, this this has been known for a while that, that um, black holes behave in this way. The, the new set of data that's caused this new story is that for the first time, a star of known type has been swallowed by a black hole. So that means we know what type of star it is, we know what type of gases and processes make it up. Um, so that gives better analysis data when the star gets pulled into the black hole and ripped apart. Because what happens is, I mean, a black hole doesn't swallow a star whole as such. Its gravity is so strong that as the star gets closer to it or gets into its the non-escapable part of its gravity well, yeah. um, it actually rips it to pieces. So it rips it into its constituent gas molecules, basically. And these molecules stretch out usually all around the black hole and they circle and circle as they as they go in, as they sort of fall in. And that circling, um, the friction caused by the the motion of them being pulled in so rapidly mm. heats the particles to an enormous heat. And it's that it's that superheated gas that's what we see of a black hole. Um, we we can see the um, the radiation given up, off by that superheated gas. That's how we basically one of the reasons we know about black holes. Um, so uh, the star of known type has has given better data because we know what type of what type of gases to expect going in there. So we now understand a little bit more about what happens as stars are pulled into black holes. Is it kind of like going down a, a black hole? You know, like water going yeah, down a black hole? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I think it's, it's, it's very much like that, yeah. Water can go round and round. You know, water on the far outside can um, go around for ages before it actually spins around. Of course, in space where there's no friction or very, very little friction, or there's a little bit of friction caused by collisions of particles, but nothing like water going down a plug hole. So things going around the outside can basically stay there for indefinitely. Like, exactly like the Earth is around the sun, you know. It orbits, the Earth is technically falling into the sun, but it orbits, its orbit is so far out that it never actually falls into the gravity well. What's, in, what's, also, what's also amazing about this is, is the time frame that it happens in. Because you, you think about, you know, space and time is just so long, you know, the, the human brain can't even... Uh, comprehend it, and things are so old. But this this process, and I'm just looking at a little video here of the the star being sucked into this black hole. Um, you know, you see a dramatic change in what it looks like in, in uh, only 138 days. Yeah, yeah, a couple of hundred days will will complete that. As the star sort of falls in, if you like, if you imagine the gravity steps off quite rapidly, it steps off with the inverse square law. So as you get closer, it gets a lot stronger. And so once it once it reaches the point that it is it is falling in mm. and not just not just in a stable orbit, then it all happen, it starts to happen quite quickly. And so it, I mean, yeah, a couple of hundred days. But if we look at the time the Earth takes to orbit the Sun, you know, it, it completes two it completes one lap at, at this distance of yeah. 150 million kilometers in um, in a year basically. But if you look at Mercury, it orbits in only 88 days. So once you get that distance. From something that the, the transit period around is quite quick. Yeah, and I of guess course it's quicker. Is. Of course, the other thing that always blows my mind about it is that, of course, yes, this, okay, this took a hundred and a couple of hundred days, but it was actually a couple of hundred days um, a few maybe I don't know a billion light years ago or something. You know, it's like it happened a long time uh, ago. Yeah. We're only just seeing it now. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. I'm yeah. not sure how far away this black hole is, but yeah, it could be, could be up to a few thousand, could be a few hundred yeah. light years away. Yeah, that's the amazing um, thing, looking back in time. It's just yeah, weird, weird, crazy. Yeah, we're basically seeing a, a, a real-time replay, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, amazing. Hey, that's really cool. Um, and I, the other thing I did want to mention, um, I just saw some news coming through that the space um, uh, SpaceX um, space station launch has been delayed again. The uh, private space company SpaceX just can't catch a break on this one after a, a week-long delay of the scheduled launch of the Falcon rocket carrying the company's Dragon spacecraft. A new date was set, and that is May the 7th. So hopefully they can get off May the, the ground. May the 7th. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's one to look out for, all right? Mm, that's Dylan's story. Thanks very much. The Auckland Stardome Observatory, and uh, we'll chat to you same time next week. Thanks, Wemo. 7.51 now here on Kiwi. Got something from the sub.